I'm going to introduce our lunchtime speaker, and he will be followed by uh, Doug Carney, um, who you all know already. And he's here, he's introduced by Hector. So I'm not going to reintroduce Doug. I'm going to just let Doug take over once Mark is finished. Uh, so we're really pleased to welcome Mark Trahan as our luncheon speaker. His talk will be followed by Doug's performance. Um, Mark is an independent print and broadcast journalist who's a member of Idaho's Shoshone Bannock tribe and a former president of the Native American Journalists Association. His blog, Trahan Reports, currently covers Native American issues and politics. He's the Charles R. Johnson Professor of Journalism at the University of North Dakota and a storied Western journalist. He was executive ed news editor of the Salt Lake Tribune, a reporter at the Arizona Republic of Phoenix, and has worked at several tribal newspapers as well. He's also the former editor of the editorial page for the Seattle Post-Intelligencer and a former columnist at the Seattle Times. Some of those newspapers I just mentioned may indeed be former newspapers. <laughs> uh, Mark is the author of, among other works, The Last Great Battle of the Indian Wars, Henry M. Jackson, Forrest J. Gerard, and the Campaign for the Self-Determination of America's Indian Tribes. Uh, I was just informed, incredible breaking news for this forum, that Mark uh, is the winner, announced just yesterday, of the National Congress of American Indians Native American Leadership Award. So, thank you. We're so glad you're here today. Thank Mark you. Trenton. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, really am delighted to be here. And when I saw the invitation from Amy and the title of the, the weekend uh, conversation, I was particularly uh, intrigued because this is something I've been writing about a lot lately. And uh, I couldn't wait to get involved. Um, so I grew up with stories about leaders. Uh, my grandmother was born in 1911 in, uh, on the Fort Peck Indian Reservation in uh, Montana. And her father was an Assiniboine tribal leader. One of his jobs, and I always think this is a cool job, was the treaty officer. And it was his job to enforce the treaty obligations on the tribe's part, point of view. And uh, he set about to do that. And my grandmother would tell stories about how, as a young girl, uh, her idea of leadership was people coming over to the house to eat. Um, because when anyone had any kind of problem, they would show up. And uh, the first thing they would do is set out food. And her father would listen to them uh, and to their problems, and then he would try to help. Uh, she used to have a favorite picture of him where he would had this uh, three-piece suit, and he went to the Capitol, U.S. Capitol, in 1908. And uh, he was on his way to lobby. And in that picture, the way my grandmother would tell the story, he said he dressed in this three-piece uh, three suit because that was his camouflage. Uh, it made him more effective. She told me she escaped this idea of leadership by going away to boarding school and uh, no more cooking. She traveled 1,100 miles uh, by train from Wolf Point, Montana to Haskell Institute in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, and some of the same stories um, about ideas of leadership was that uh, the modern world meant doing things differently and so she was very much a part of that generation. I always thought it was interesting and why I wanted to begin with this on a talk of democracy is that um, because she was born in 1911, Irene Clark Trahant was um, a naturalized citizen. Uh, the first wave of American Indians as citizens was 1924 after the Citizenship Act. So what stories do we tell about democracy and how are those stories passed along? I've been thinking a lot about this lady lately as the United States goes around the world and brags about democracy and self-governance. And the world is often conf confused by these stories because they see that the U.S. is not what it says it to, is purports to be. In fact, um, The Economist just last week published its annual dem democracy index measuring how a country governs itself. And that metric is based on five categories, electoral process, pluralism, civil liberties, functioning government, political participation, and culture. At the top of the list, again, for many years in a row now, Norway. 
and the United States ranked 21st, tied with Italy. <laughs> Last year, the economists demoted the United States from a full democracy to a flawed democracy, citing a serious decline in public trust in U.S. institutions. Unfortunately, this index shows that democracy is in decline around the globe. The economists measured 89 countries and found that just 4.5 percent of the world's population lives in fully functioning democracies, a drop from 8.9 percent just two years ago. So is this the story we know? Is this the story we tell? In the media and the public life, are we even good at zeroing in on the problems of U.S. democracy? We hear all the time about the Electoral College or gerrymandering or insane rules governing the vote, yet we rarely challenge the system as a whole. We don't look at the foundation. A story. On November 24, 1805, the Lewis and Clark expedition had to decide where to spend the winter. They decided to make the decision with a vote, and every member of the expedition participated in what they called the first election held west of the Mississippi. Clark's slave York and Sacagawea both voted, 60 years before the end of slavery and more than a century before either women or Indians would be granted citizenship. This story is supposed to be about the egalitarian nature of the new America and the value of democracy. But the thing is, it was a story that democracy is brought to the West by Lewis and Clark. It's nonsense, and yet this is a foundational story. Democracy scholar Robert Maynard Hutchins once said, democracy is every member of the community must have a part in the government. The real test of a democracy is to the extent to which everybody in society is involved in effective political discussion. If you use that definition, virtually all of the American Indian nations, tribes, and bands were democratic from the beginning of time. The Shoshone band that met the Corps of Discovery already had a system in place. The methods of leadership suited the people and the band's collective ambition. Meriwether Lewis even gave us a hint in his own journal. He said, every individual is his own sovereign master and acts from the dictates of his own mind. The authority of the chief being nothing more than mere animation, supported by the influence for which his own conduct may have acquired in the minds of the individuals who composed the band. Lewis went on to say that the chief is not a hereditary post, but one earned through influence. As I understand it, the concept of Shoshone leadership was even more specific. There's a lot written about peace chiefs and war chiefs, but that concept was much broader than that. A band's leader might be for a day or a week. There might be a fish boss who would guide a group to fish when the salmon runs were abundant. Then someone else would step in for a different leadership task. The people were always choosing a leader. They always picked who they wanted to follow. And if not, they'd simply move on to another leader or take up with another band. Again, if you use fishing as an example, some leaders were quite good at constructing weirs or small dams to capture fish. Others preferred to hunt salmon, chasing them up the river with a spear pole. The governance of these bands was, by any definition, democratic. Elections were held often. Essentially, whenever a specific task was needed, people voted by participating. This initial distortion of what a democratic, of a democratic idea complicates the American relationship with tribal nations. For much of our history, the Americans would argue for democracy when they were really seeking a dictator. They wanted bosses, somebody who could speak for every band of Shoshones and sign treaties for land deals. This narrative explains why there's continued tension about tribal leadership even today, because the same American government could not comprehend a native democracy goes about promoting self-determination around the world. Another layer of this same story was in 1934. Congress passed what was called the Wheeler-Howard Act, or the Indian Reorganization Act, and it was designed to, quote, bring democracy to tribes. My grandfather's cousin was a man by the name of George P. Levada. He had gone to Carlisle Indian School and had been successful at the Union Pacific Railroad as a laborer working his way up to advisor general on Indian affairs for the president of Union Pacific. When I asked Uncle George, I always called him uncle, when I asked Uncle George what he did, 
he always replied, I'm organizing, organizing. When folks needed housing, they'd get a committee together. When more jobs were needed, they'd get a committee together. He said Shoshone Bannocks first started working at the railway, railway road because they organized and sent candies to employees' children. This was Depression era and jobs were scarce. So when the Indians came to work hell, they welcomed them with open arms, George said. No one resented it at all. They weren't taking anyone's jobs. Lovada left the railroad for the Indian service in 1929 and his job again was organizing. This is just one way of solving the Indian problem, he said. I'm tired of sympathizing with poor, downtrodden Indians. I want to find a way to get everybody working and organize. In 1935, Levada became sort of a traveling salesman for democracy. It was his mission to convert tribes to the Indian Reorganization Act and to have them pass a constitution. My uncle was based in Portland, but he traveled to reservations across the country explaining this form of government. Indeed, my own tribe, the Shoshone Bannocks, adopted the Indian Reorganization Act Constitution, but that document did not bring about the sort of participation that Levada and others expected. The Indian Reorganization Act had a provision for tribes to accept it or reject it, and about half the tribes in the country rejected that model constitution, while others passed it and came up with other forms of governance. The constitutional model that tribes adopted, including Shoshone Bannock, uh, had this idea of a check and a balance with a real colonial twist. The official governing body is the elected tribal council, but before laws, ordinances, or contracts could be put into effect, they were required to send the paperwork for approval to the U.S. Secretary of the Interior. In effect, the U.S. government decided it should serve as the check and the balance. Levada was later uh, one of the founders of the National Congress of American Indians, which just gave me this award. But it also, um, <laughs> looking backwards, what we know today, my uncle seems a paradox. I think he instinctively understood the democratic process and must have known deep down that Indians were always democratic. He, after all, was always organizing, forming a committee, ready to act, way to find people to solve problems. I remember one time seeing him long after he retired at a meeting of Idaho tribes. At a quarter to eight, shortly before the meeting was to begin, George was wandering the halls. He was shouting, come on, everyone, it's time to start, time to get moving. I caught a sense of urgency in his voice. That meeting, perhaps every meeting, was important. The people had business before them. This was his democracy in action. Over the years, I heard George call this same thing many times. In fact, the National Congress of American Indians formally recognized him as their sergeant of arms, uh, a lifetime honor that he carried. While he was an inherent Democrat, he was also a strident voice for official BIA orthodoxy, buying into the mythology that democracy was American gift. A gift. And again, those words from Robert Maynard Hutchins, the real test of a democracy is the extent to which everybody in society is involved in effective political discussion. It's a high standard for any people who claim self-government. And the United States mostly fails this test along the lines of The Economist. Let's do some math. There have been 12,244 people elected to Congress in 1789. The first woman, Jeanette Rankin of Montana, was elected in 1916. Since then, there have been 327 women, about a third of whom are serving now in the U.S. House of Representatives. Montana has never elected a second woman as its representative. As my friend, the late Cherokee Chief Wilma Mankiller used to say, where are your women? How can a people govern with only half? Then Mankiller is even more on point when you factor in the representation of Native American women, as in zero. That is 12,244 to nothing. At least 11 women have tried to change that. Most recently, Denise Juno, who ran for Rankin seat in Montana a century later. This year, two Native American women are running for Congress in New Mexico and Utah. Who knows, this could be the year to break records. We already know that more women than ever, more than 400, are running for Congress this time around as a referendum on Donald J. Trump and his policies. Native American men have not fared much better in the representation department. There have been less than two dozen 
and two are serving now in the, ha in the house. Back to the math. That works out to 0.037% or one third of 1%. But what's even worse about this is if you read the treaties that the United States passed in the 19th century, several of them include provisions promising delegates to the Congress. The 1830 Treaty of Dancing Rabbit, for example, explicit, explicitly says the Choctaw Nation will have a delegate to the Congress. Delegates are a total invention of Congress. The first one, James White, was appointed on November 11, 1794 to represent the territory of Ohio. This happened before Congress even figured out what a delegate was supposed to do. The Congressional Research Service said there was a wide-ranging discussion on the House floor about a delegate's proper role, including whether they should serve in the House or Senate. White's role was defined as no more than an envoy to Congress because he could not vote. But he was there. He had a voice in the political discussion. Since White, there have been at least one delegate in every Congress except for two years between 1797 and 1799. Today there are six delegates in Congress representing Puerto Rico, Washington DC, Guam, US Virgin Islands, American Samoa, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. But the treaty promised to tribes? We're back to zero. In a way, Indian country is a metaphor for the unrepresentative nature of American democracy, the lack of effective political discussion. This is a problem that began with the founding of the United States and I think has grown to what should be beyond acceptable to any democracy. So on July 16, 1787, Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth came up with the, the Connecticut Compromise. The delegates proposed a two-house solution where smaller states would be treated equally with larger states. This, by the way, from the very same debate where the population would be figured by adding, quote, the whole number of free persons, including those bound to a service of terms of years, and excluding Indians not taxed, plus three-fifths of other persons. Slaves and Indians, America's original sins. And those evils are the very reason we have a corrupted democracy. The southern states wanted more power and to preserve their so-called unique institution. And today, to answer that, again go back to the math. In 1789, Delaware was the smallest state in the Union. Its people only told about 8% of the largest state, Virginia. Today, Wyoming is the smallest state by population, and it's less than 1.5% of California. If you factor in the voting population, that imbalance between one vote in California and one vote in Wyoming is more than 60-fold. In fact, if you add up all the senators from small states, there are 42 representatives, 42 members representing a population smaller than California. 42 to 2. One image for me surely sh clearly shows that gap. It's pictures of the Women's March in Los Angeles on January 2nd. More people were on the streets of Los Angeles than live in Wyoming. <laughs> this represents the many women who should have more of a voice in the effective political discussion and the American system of governments. The Supreme Court's already dealt with some of these issues, starting with a series of cases in 1962. It required state governments to reform. In fact, that remains one of the great divisions in the last case was who is represented, just voters or citizens or every person in this country. Last year, the Supreme Court weighed in on this and it said that states may count all residents, whether or not they're eligible to vote in drawing districts. This decision was a major statement on the meaning of a fundamental principle of one person, one vote. Yet that case still represents a deep division two theories of representative democracy. One seeks to ensure equality with elected officials tending to the interests of all the people, and the other to ensure that only those who have political power form a vote and control government. Can it be fixed? I think we start by telling stories that show our system inequality. Elections are imperfect vehicles after all. Donald Trump was elected with 46.1% of the vote even though Hillary Clinton earned 48.2%. Minor party candidates, including Jill Stein and Gary Johnson, picked up 
5.7%. But what if that had only been round one? What if there had been a runoff election, something that's quite common in global governance? Then Trump and Clinton would have campaigned again, one-on-one, -on -one, and one of the candidates would have had to reach the magic mark of 50% plus one. This is true for past elections, too. Barack Obama won both of his elections with a 50-plus majority, and as did President Bush when he was re-elected in 2004. But George Bush and Al Gore would have needed runoffs, as, and that's also true for Bill Clinton, who never did reach a majority, 43% in 1992 and 49% in 1996. We have a structural problem that can be fixed. As I mentioned, many states have already done this. Republicans in Congress recently were giddy when they won the runoff election in Georgia. Democrat John Ossoff surprised everybody and fell short in the second round. But there was a second round. And that second round meant that there was a majority that represented the district. More across the country, states and cities are experimenting with proportional representation, which gives every citizen a voice. In a liberal western city, that means conservative voters could count on at least a percentage of the cities, or vice versa. One may, way to make a proportional system work is an instant runoff election. This, this process involves invo voters picking a favorite candidate, then a second pick, and then a third. In each round, the candidate with the lowest number of votes, votes is mathematically eliminated. The winner earns a majority. I'm especially, well, I'm going to skip this because I wanted to save some time for. So how do we make election reform happen as a start without the drawn out process of a constitutional convention? Congress could require a second round of presidential voting before the Electoral College meets. That still might not require, result in a majority, but at least it would be a lot closer in that direction. Canada scores quite high on the Economist Democracy Index. I think it's number six. Yet Canada, like the United States, has a significant flaw in its structure of democracy. The last election, for example, was considered a huge win for the Liberal Party, a party that had been declared dead a decade ago. But Liberals only won 39% of the vote. The Conservatives had 31% of the vote, and the New Democrats earned 19%. The Green Party captured 3.5%, and yet it only ended up with one seat in Parliament which is still not as bad as the US, where Republicans won 52% of the vote for Congress and controlled 57% of the seats. The reason for this in both countries is a district system or first past the post. It's where one that most of the world has rejected in favor of elections that are more representative. In Canada's elections, for example, had there been a system with proportional representation the Liberals and the New Democrats would have had to work together to form a government. Then that government would have been actually representative of most Canadians. These days, Justin Trudeau gets a lot of praise as a leader of Canada, much of it worthy. But he also abandoned his promise to reform the country's electoral system. Before the election, Trudeau said, we can do better. After the election, he said, eh, it's too hard and there's no consensus about what an election system should look like. A democratic country or community ought to be self-governing in a way that every member is allowed a fair and effective political discussion. But the biggest challenge for this country is that the country is changing fast and there's so many barriers to trying to get to stop that change. Part of it's just the speed of change. When Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980, the population of the United States was 80% white. Today, it's 63% white. One demographic profile by the National Journal shows how dramatically this country has changed. Reagan won with 56% of white voters in 1980. But in 2012, when non-white voters accounted for 28% of the electorate, Mitt Romney took 60% of white voters and lost by four percentage points. Of course, Donald Trump found a solution, albeit temporary. His margin among whites without college degrees is the largest among any candidate in exit polls since 1980. More than two-thirds of non-college whites back Trump compared to 28% who supported Clinton, a 39-point advantage for Trump among this group. 
that was key to winning Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, and thus the election. But this is just a blip. The country's diversity trend is at its very beginning. I'll give you an example from Indian country again. American Indian and Alaska Native population grew at 1.4% since 2013, compared to less than half of a percent for whites. Even more than just the diversity, the changing nature of the millennials, the youngest Americans, this group has become majority minority for the first time in 2014, with 52% now being part of a minority race or an ethnic group, according to the census. In 13 years, voters of color will be the majority in almost um, 25 states. Nevada is a great place to look at these trends. In 2012, Nevada voters were 65% white. In 2016, that number dropped below 60%. And now to win office in Nevada, the winning coalition has to be including about a third of white voters, plus significant majorities from Latino, African American, Asian American, and Native American. Other states where these coalitions will be growing in possibility Alaska, Arizona, Wisconsin, and eventually Oklahoma. This demographic imbalance is also part of this urban-rural divide. More than half of U.S. cities are majority non-white. The largest group within that is Latino, according to the Brookings Institute. Slightly more African Americans, meanwhile, <coughs> live in suburbs than in city centers. And overall, the U.S. population is changing dramatically and becoming less white. Less California, <coughs> excuse me. So whiter states will become more disproportionately powerful in the Senate and in presidential elections. Less California politically, more Iowa, more New Hampshire. Or as Stanford University political science David Brady told Wired Magazine, if you're a person of color in California, you're screwed. That is the story of US democracy. But the thing is, even with the stacked deck, even with the electoral system that's unfair, the country's demographics are catching up. I was in Montana on election night, and in an odd way, Barack Obama complicated things. He got people to turn out in really remarkable numbers, and that didn't happen again in 2016. It's not that more Trump voters turned out, although in some cases that was true. It's much more of a story of who did not vote. What happens when minority voters all turn out? Think landslide. What's striking about today's democracy is even now, Republican candidates are not trying to build a coalition with minority voters, young voters, or even fix the gender gap that's been a problem for decades. Millennials are now 90 million people and are more independent than previous generations. Most millennials lean toward Democrats, but even those who say they are Republican see the world very differently than most Republican candidates. Pew Research found the generational differences between Republicans are some of the most striking differences within any party. On social issues, ranging from gay rights to immigration, younger Republicans are far less conservative than their elders. Many years ago, I was uh, speaking to a voter activist group. Uh, it was actually the Friends Committee in Washington, DC. And it was one of those days where um, Virtually everything you say works. And the audience was laughing and connecting, and it was really great. And uh, a politician who is a friend of mine and I admire, she came up to me afterwards and said, what's wrong with you? I was talking back because I expected people to say, what a great talk you just gave. <laughs> and uh, she said, you had that audience, and you could have done anything you wanted with them, and all you did was tell stories. <laughs> Thinking about that, though, I believe that's where we start. We tell stories. We tell stories as Californians, as citizens. We tell stories as people who demand effective political discussion. It's our stories that will carry us one more generation, and it's our stories that will press the country to live up to that promise. Thank you, and I'd be happy to ask a few questions. I think it's essential for every American to know two stories, the stories of genocide and slavery. And without those two things, you have such a hole in your knowledge that you cannot be a good citizen. Um, 
one of the things that I really like that's spreading, and it started in Montana. Montana is a really interesting state anyway, but uh, it started in Montana where they have a program called Indian Education for All. And uh, you cannot graduate from schools in Montana without having a basic understanding of Indian history. And their idea is that this is Montana history, that this is the way we came to be. And I think that same idea ought to spread across the country. So that would be how I would address it. Yeah, I think it's also, I mean, there are so many things I didn't mention, but that'd be one of them. Geography is another one. Um, gerrymandering would be another one. In um, fact, um, what's interesting, and again, you look at the states where things are working better than other states, and Montana has the highest percentage of Native Americans in the legislature of any states. In fact, w I do a database with different people running, and one of the interesting things is, um, Congress is 0.037%, which is only slightly better than the federal bench, which is 0.0111%. <laughs> but state legislatures are about 1%. Mm -hmm. And where that, and that sounds like a small number, but when Indians are only 2% of the country, it's not bad. Mm -hmm. And where that comes from is states that have strong districting systems. In Montana, there are 13 legislators, and it's because they really pay attention to doing a great job with the districting process. The Supreme Court, I think, is putting more pressure on states to do that. And I think that's actually kind of a good news thing, is that districting is going to get better. I'm really optimistic with that, yeah. Yeah, I, I've actually been writing <laughs> about what I call the canon. What are the canon of Native American stories that people should know? And... Um, for example, um, right now, and this is how I used it in the recent column, uh, there's a play in Washington, D.C. Uh, about Cherokee history. It's called Sovereignty. It's at the Arena Theater for another two weeks in case anyone's back there. And um, in Sovereignty, she tells the story, the playwright's Mary Catherine Nagel, she tells the story about um, the Trail of Tears. And in the Trail of Tears, so the Cherokee Nation in Georgia was one of the most sophisticated tribes in the country, they had a Supreme Court, bilingual press, they just had uh, extraordinarily high literacy rate. And when gold was found in Georgia, it didn't matter, they wanted them gone. And she tells the story that a lot of Indians have been uncomfortable with about how this one group felt that the only way to survive was to move to Oklahoma. And uh, they were a family called the Ridges, and the editor of the newspaper was part of them. Uh, a gentleman by the name Major Ridge, and um, the Cherokees at the time thought it was treason, and they were murdered when they got to Oklahoma for this act. And she, in his play, writes a defense of them. In, in a book I wrote, I also wrote a defense of them, where their ideas uh, were, if we don't move, we're dead. And so we can claim this land all we want, but Georgia will not let us survive. And uh, it's a really interesting argument about how you tell history and who gets to tell it. And their story has been basically um, one that Cherokees wouldn't talk about for a century. And now it's coming back as, wait, there, there is some merit to what they were saying. We're here. So yeah, there needs to be more of all those stories and uncovering those. It's a great point. In fact, it's always funny. There's two phrases that always kind of get me going. One of is, it's our Vietnam comparing to a war where we're spending too much. When Indian wars were Vietnam, <laughs> it really was an issue of economics and why people change. The second one is whenever they say uh, the largest massacre, um, they were never the largest massacres. Las Vegas was nowhere near Bear River and some of the other uh, traditional massacres or Round Valley here in California. Um, yeah, I think we need to figure out a way to do that. It, it's really unfortunate that it ends up being the press. And when the press educates, it's always in a crisis situation. So we have to explain what's going on in the context of a story rather than the broader history. I think more states doing what Montana does is really the way. If now Montana, Washington, and Arizona are all doing Indian education for all, that's a good start.
Okay, they measure 89 countries based on um, electoral process, and that includes pluralism, civil liberties, functioning of a government, political participation, and culture. Culture, culture was the last one? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then one question. You mentioned on the onset of your talk that you said that um, America was in decline. Our study showed that- No, America global democracy is in decline. Oh, global democracy is yeah, in decline. But America did go down the list. Um, Two years ago. Okay. Yeah, I, I was only asking, not to challenge your findings or anything of that sort, but I'm a student here at UCI and I just finished reading a, a, a book by, a, by, by an author by the name of Robert Kagan and he puts a book out stating that the myth that America itself is in decline is actually not true. No, this is just about democracy. Okay, it's democracy it's about in, a, in, um, in a global context. Right. Okay. Right. And this is The Economist, it's not my rankings. Glad we got that straight. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so I'm just going to do a couple of uh, pieces. Um, part of the reason why I'm here is because um, Amy saw me read in 2017? Uh, yes. Yeah, right, 2000. No, right after the election. Yeah, OK. So right before yeah, the inauguration. Right, so it was 2017. And um, um, I yelled and I spit a lot. And, and I'm <laughs> hoping he will again. And I <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Um, so um, I'm just going to do a couple of different things, and I'll sort of talk throughout them. But in this book, Buck Studies, I have a bunch of poems called That Loud Ass Colored Silence, each one addressing a different kind of discourse, I guess you could say. That Loud Ass Colored Silence protest. We, we, wish, wish, oh, we, are, we shall over, we shall over, over, we, we are over, we are, we shall over, we shall overcome. It's what the unwanted, wanted, don't want. And what the wanted, unwanted, don't want. We, we shall, oh, we walk hand in heart free. We are all afraid. We are over someday, some, someday, some. I ain't what? We are over, are over, we'll. Real, the whole wide, all afraid. Walloped up into dream, upended and marched into hound's tooth of knit elbows, or gardens of a million clenched buds. The doubled vox redoubles into synced redoubt and sinks into that old silencing right. Shh, we are over. We are not. Oh, deep, oh, deep, oh, oh, deep, deep, oh, we be whole wide. We ain't I and am. We, we are, we are. Shh. I can't eat. Shh. Hashtag Black Lives t -t -t Stutter. Shh. Bow wow, says the dog. Shh. Hashtag Black Lives Stammer. Shh. We are, we are, we. Shh. Hashtag Black Lives y -y -y Yammer. Shh. I can't eat. Bow wow, says the dog. Shh. Bow wow, says the dog. Shh. Hashtag Black Lives. Mutter. Shh. What we want is to not be your what's unwanted, your what's or your un. We want what's what to be un yours. We want you to want what you want to want. Shh. Fireman points the water. Shh. Night and day policemen work. Shh. Shh. I can't aim. Shh. Shh. Why won't you shh? Oh, yeah. That's, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, lives. My son was playing a video game, touchscreen video game. Um, <clears throat> and that's what, if you've ever played video games before, you know that every time your character dies, they run out of lives. Usually have a limited amount unless you use a cheat code and you can have unlimited lives, which is handy, I guess, in a video game. <laughs> lives. Said I died, his game finger on the burning one. Try again, said I, touching his shoulder. Then he was piked on spikes and said, I died, game finger on the stuck one. You can do it, said I, mussing low his brown marina. Said I died again. 
gaming finger on the shocked, I'm tired of this, and turns from the burning world to run and jump in the high world. Such shining gems up that little sky. Runs, but then said, I died touching the falling one. I know you're gonna make it, said I, too long since cutting his shadow fade too thick. Oh, said I died, gaming finger at the falling one. Said I, son, maybe you should, oh, said I died, the falling one. Hun, you can't just keep on, said I, oh, a pendulum pendulums. Said I died, game finger touching the gutted one. He needs a good jumping and jumping, said I, oh, said I died. Oh, the one who falls and burns gets cut down, turns from, I'm tired of this, son. Run, said I, or stop. Let's do, oh, let's, let's switch gears a little bit. So Manus, uh, Manes, I should say, is, is Roman, um, old Roman for spirit, ghosts. So Manesology would be the study of spirits and ghosts. Manesology, after Charlottesville, but before it too, shit. They called me to speak on the problem. Oh, I'll sh I, let me start just one last thing. Like oftentimes when issues of race um, come up, uh, they, they call black people who are accustomed to speaking in front of other people and they ask for an explanation of some kind. Um, and this poem in some ways is about, is about work, right? And about who should do the work. And when you think about the condition that brought most African-American people to this country, it was about who should do the work. <laughs> Manisology. They called me to speak on the problem and told me I could from my home, where children's crayons and software are riots of color and murmurs. Sometimes my hours spent as days of spinning my head from years and eras, just all the time, in tombstone columns, look. I'd speak on the problem, I do. N and I had happened was misgiving it as ours in our home. We nicked and dug at it that night, all the while reckoning us as spading at what's ours until we knew what we could do, then kissed a while. This looks like crying when your mouth is your skin. The problem though, had our numbers, our children's, Good shoes are made of cinders. The pairs stay everywhere they go, even when they haven't been. Since it, the problems, what we must do, have done's the problem. I said I'd been saying, like I gots to tote some sick hearts on my back, a gurney, or my blood, a soap for dirt, their shit made into ours. And said that's why the nerves, the kind of what she say. But that's just what I'm saying is, after this problem, we made love. And that's somebody's problem over there. We were at it, our backs ours, and as though magic, those tombstones slanted to appear a ward. Views skewed thus when your standing's to be prone. I say, must I speak on their problem? That when we're our, making love is it? Poor interviewer chew the detour of their invisible tongue, and they'd spit, they'd spit too, would be so clear, so yet thirsty, I speak on, a problem. Night after that instance, my daughter clambers our bed for half the night after reading about ghosts. My son, though, slept, a babe under blades, fan spinning back to where it started and to where, and, thank you. <laughs> On language, some terms for black study. Alibi. To what had happened was what happened into what you had to have happened. Black. Indicates a pre-inscribed mark on a blanked surface. Blackface. Blacks in. A double negative. Blackface. Non-blacks in. Purifying curative. Hair of the wog that you bit. Black feminism. Ain't I ain't that woman? Black masculinism, trick of trying to be the man without being his dick. Blackness, the condition of being the shit when it happens. 
blues, the, getting over, just getting over it, by going down to get down in it. Code switching. When high functioning masochists mistake their tongues for whips. Mammy puts the milk in milk and honey. Master, one who possesses and thus dispossesses the dist from self-possession. Noise, see signal. A signal you find noisome. Passing, being fain to faint faintness. Pimps, those who make something off the ones they make nothing. Political correctness, slang for the powerful's offense at no longer being empowered to sling offense at long dis empowered beings with impunity. Post black, I just read can't. Post race, a way of passing the buck. Post racism, a way of bucking the past. Quadroom, a two bit black for four times the bucks. Racial profiling, to find what you're looking for, even when it's somewhere else. Racism, an often transparent value system of predetermining invisible content via opaque containers. Race card, white idiom for shut the fuck up, nigger! <laughs> Reverse racism, alibi baby from the tip top. Self-hating. A present time pastime when pastime presses the present so past oppression's presence comes to pass. <laughs> Sellout. Has skin in the game and is game to game skin to win when skin is the game. Slave. One whose dist position is that of possession at the possessor's disposition. Signal. See noise. A noise you find significant. Transgressive. Black. Burning a bridge you're stood on. Uncle Tom, a human shield with no humans involved. Cool. All right, so um, one of the uh, great um, con contributions to science um, and, and medical science was when um, African Americans would flee plantations, a huge part of the logic around slavery was that plantation life was better for black people. It's important to remember that, that this was a shifting technology. Depending upon the cultural needs at the time, defenses of keeping black people on plantations shifted. It was a lot of innovation. So like when there was concern about um, the well-being of black people, because abolitionists were talking about this is cruel, um, people who were pro-slavery would say, well, it would be more cruel to let black people free, um, similarly to the idea of going to the woods to let go of your chihuahua, right? They're not prepared to live out in the natural world, in the world, because we have, to, just we have to protect them. There was also, of course, moments where there was the thought of like, they will aggress and they will attack us, so you know, we gotta keep them here to keep us safe, right? Um, but in the logics of this, one thing that people oftentimes would say is that slave plantation life wasn't that terrible. So when you actually had people who ran away you had to account for the fact that they ran away from something that wasn't terrible. And so there was a mental disorder created called drapetomania, which is the illogical, irrational, psychological disorder that would lead a black person to run from a plantation. Drapetomania, a praxis. Bound as one to the site must be to be the sites is a deed to bind one to a two, thus into two and not one. The deed sites sites to ones, thus the site site is ones ones by deed, and thus the one to a two is indeed ones two. For the one to a two to be one, the one must be out the ones site which is to be one bound to be unbound. One is indeed bound to sight one bound to be outbound as out of bounds on sight and thus must recite the unsighted into the one sight. My mind's not right. To be unbound, one indeed must sever the bond by which one is bound to the sight and thus by deed to the one. 
To sever a deed is, to, is a deed by which one severs a bound sight from one. When one is bound to one sight, to sever one from sight is to, never, is to sever one from the ones, and thus the unbound one is bound to one by making the ones one into two. One sight into one sight and one one, e.g. one into one one and one one. Thus, for the one to a two to be bound to a one to a one, one must unsight from sight and recight be bound two to an unbound sight. My mind's not right. I mean, that's, that's kind. Y'all know what the fuck that just was. I just, I, I, I don't, I don't. I, I appreciate that because even as I was reading it, I was like, ah, you should have read something else. All right, um, last, last. Um, the words may not be as important as the energy you put into them. I appreciate that, you know, you know. For one of the original deplorables of America, I appreciate that. Right. <laughs> like, I can tell you about deplorables. Masochism. When your body isn't your body, you a we sick and them's ain't my people, you's my people. I rent a car and crash it. I rent a red car and crash it at a green wall. I come out like a mess of dark seeds of things. We's hurt. I pay the deductible, fine for wrecking their me of theirs. I broke and entered that body of mine is theirs and theirs is. Alarms everywhere. We scared. They said, it's all yours, officer. What a relief. The police couldn't excess of me because I wasn't mine in the first place, yes? We's feeling low. Let's string my body of theirs and watch it shimmy. Click. I post myself of theirs and say, wish I was here. I'm laughing. It sounds like them. Cakewalking. My hand up their hand up my hand up their hand. My lips of theirs don't move when I talk. For this next trick, I ain't done nothing they haven't seen. My eyes are their assholes. Either my head or what I see is their head. Them's ain't my feelings. Use my feelings. The airbag Gillespie's. Wee's bleeding, underlined in my journal. Who taught you to? When the chalk licks me up, this bodying's a plantation of want. Wee's hungry. Them's ain't my hashtag. Use my hashtag. I'm working side by side with the hounds. Teeth on ass and teeth on ass and teeth. Whose lips are moving? When my body ain't my body, I need directions to a hole in the ground. That's not our bodies, that's your bodies. Thank y'all, honey. Give us us us. Freeishly, I have escaped to where I was the whole time. I'm, 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 I'm. One last thing. Somewhere in there. Um, so I'm gonna read some 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 fun things. Just a couple. Um, so uh, how many people here are familiar with the Stations of the Cross? Yeah. Oh, good, good. All right, so, um, so the Stations of the Cross, the Passion Play, is the 14 steps along the journey that uh, Jesus took when he was going to be uh, crucified. Um, and I thought to myself, like, that's a, you know, like that's a, 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 a warm story. And, like, because it's oftentimes used in Passion Plays, I thought that on some performances there might need to be an understudy, right? And so I decided to write a retelling of the Passion Plays uh, starring Bruh Rabbit in the position of Christ. And uh, the reason why is I was interested in the idea that black uh, subjectivities, um, um, you know, a part of how we're oftentimes used, right, in narratives, right, is as a site of suffering, right, a site of suffering. Um, and so I thought to myself, who could be um, associated with um, African-American uh, uh, folklore who would refuse suffering. And it's also, of course, rooted with Native American folklore as well, that the trickster figure of the rabbit uh, frequents there. So this is Bruh uh, Rabbit in a poem called several, I'll read just like one or two, called Eche Caniculus, which means Behold a Rabbit. Um, and this is like an important poem, so it begins with a Latin uh, epigraph. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Airway Quad olere, autumn ice cray, autumn Asian stay, autumn os cray, done aid play per herbre abbot ray. <laughs> For years, I thought we created was crucified under unconscious pilot. 
Thus, who flew this whole thing wasn't woke. The stone rolled away in Christ rock. This one's about democracy. Simon of Serene, it should say Simon of Serene helps Jesus carry the cross, but by this point, Jesus isn't there. So Simon of Serene carried the cross. Soldiers forced Simon of Serene to carry the cross. Flinching toward a lynching to gnash on, the mass was there when they, on cue de Bark's international new booty fresh off the, welcome, welcome, Flair Fishers went guesting his conscripted shoulder to the, were you there when they, these ways is strange, says Simon of Cyrene. Simon of Cyrene fixed to tote the beam. Welcome, welcome, Nash. Rabbit deep up the cut, about because folk need a thing to suffer. Aside, that timber won't carry itself, Simon of Cyrene. Someone must do this labor. Aside, aside, here's Trapezius does, boss. Around here, we pass the buck like a hot nigger killer. That last, a way to say red skin tater. Nash. These ways is strange, say Simon of Cyrene, beam to his back. A flare, a crack, a crack. He could, he could get it, but this time, no. Renounce, abjure, where there's spore, there's hair. There, there's hair, there's hope, that to the hole's blackness some shit finds its way. Simon may one day say this to his children of Jerusalem. While larking, they take turns picking at the splinter ever interred in the Cyrenian skin. Thank you all.